Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. I got a little bit dizzy there. We're gonna hit you up with some 19th Amendment in this video. We're gonna take a look at the text and we're gonna take a look at a short history of women's suffrage and how it came into fruition in 1919 and 1920 following World War I. So giddy up for that, kiddies. Why don't you sit back and relax and see if it can't grow your brain 10 times its size. So the words are quite simple, guys. You can look at them on the wall right now. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. So that's the words that we're going to lead up to, which is an exact replica of the 15th Amendment, the right of black males to vote, except race, we're substituting sex. So let's take a look really at kind of where the first seeds are sown in the suffrage movement. Remember, suffrage is the right to vote. Women's suffrage, of course, is relating to the words that I just read to you. That's the vocab that you're going to need. Say it a million times. Women's suffrage is the right to vote. <laughs> Constitutional Convention in 1787, and we're just going to say that there's really no women's voice there. Abigail Adams, I think, is the only one that mentions it in a letter to John Adams, remember the ladies, but they don't remember the ladies. And in fact, when we really look at kind of what's going on with direct voting in the original Constitution, we're talking about the House of Representation. Uh, the Electoral College is completely indirect. Senators are chosen by their state legislatures. So in terms of people actually going out and voting, we're only really talking about the House. And those questions qualifications are left to the state. It's kind of a reserved power. And no states back then, except New Jersey. New Jersey let women vote. And I say let, like they let them because it's a natural right and such. Didn't restrict their natural right to vote until 1807. And at that point, really, uh, we're done talking about the Constitution and voting rights. So let's take a look at kind of the period leading up to the Civil War. We'll go from the Civil War to World War I, and then bada boom, bada bing, you'll be smarter. Before the Civil War, we're going to throw the biggest word at you. We're going to get the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention, which is held in central western New York, and it's the first time that women are gathering in order to voice their um, opinions about their rights. Not specifically about the right to vote, even though that's included. It's really about property rights and really just banging the drum for the first time. And that's uh, the Women's Declaration of Sediments. I'm just throwing vocab at you. In a sense, that's like the Women's Declaration of Independence. Basically, the idea here is how can we have a society based on consent of the governed when half of the governed don't give their consent? So that's really the starting point. And really, Seneca Falls is a culmination of women being involved with the abolitionist movement. Really, the right of women to vote is very closely associated with the right uh, for African Americans to live free. William Lloyd Garrison, the uh, famous abolitionist from Massachusetts, who was a press operator, he wrote a publication, an anti-slavery publication, was also talking about women's rights in the early 1840s, 1850s. So uh, abolitionists like the African-American Frederick Douglass, who lived in Rochester, is starting to hook up with Elizabeth Stanton and with uh, Lucretia Mott, uh, Quakers, religious folks, uh, prohibitionists, temperance movement folks, kind of social reformers that want to get their hands in the giddy and get women the right to vote. So that culminates, like we mentioned before, in the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention. Um, and then really there's kind of a pause. There's a pause for about 30 years as we deal with the issue of slavery. The 1850s is really racked with uh, the Fugitive Slave Act and uh, John Brown and leading up to the Civil War. Then of course we get the Civil War and it's really important at this point before we trans kind of fur into the uh, post-Civil War era, to remember that the amendments passed in the Civil War are going to be really at the heart of the argument of women saying that this should include us as well. The 13th Amendment, not so much, but that 14th Amendment, specifically in that 14th Amendment, not only in the Equal Protection Clause, that state shall not deny its citizens equal protection, but in Clause 2 of the 14th Amendment, it specifically talks about how uh, states are not going to be allowed to discriminate against voters. In this case, they're referring to black male voters, but women are going to make that argument in the courts. So let's take a look at post-Civil War. So post-Civil War, 
Civil War, there's actually some really quick activity. Uh, the late 1860s, you have a kind of a flurry of new states coming in. Uh, Utah, Washington, um, Wyoming, and their state constitutions allowed women to vote. There's various reasons for that. Some of it is to attract women to move out west, but there's definitely some kind of like state action, and that's going to be a focus of one of the groups, the American Women's Suffrage Association, who's really going to argue that this should be done on a state-by-state -state basis. Kind of think of like the gay marriage debate that's going on now. There are some civil rights groups that say, let's deal with each state, let's legalize it where we can, and then that will kind of move towards a national scene. When others go, this is a constitutional issue, we need to go after the big boy, the big guns, and change the law nationally. And that would be the National Women's Suffrage Association. So the National Women's Suffrage Association, led by Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Stanton, are arguing that, you know, we got to go to the courts, we have to get an amendment. They really were against the 15th Amendment because it was only for black males. They were arguing, we need to go after the big boy here and get something that includes women as well. And the American Suffrage Association was saying, let's get, you know, the abolitionist thing done and get black males the right to vote, and then we'll deal with kind of that women issue next. Nevertheless, those two groups are eventually going to forge and uh, kind of become one force arguing for a new amendment. The National Women's Suffrage Association actually gets a court case. That court case, Minor versus Happerset, is going to argue that the 14th Amendment um, should nationally give women the right to vote. And uh, the court actually unanimously decides that the 14th Amendment's intention was for African Americans and states can still deny women the right to vote. So on goes the fight. And in 1872, Senator Aaron Sargent from California becomes the first to propose an amendment to the Constitution, which is soundly and resoundly defeated. There's just not the support um, for it to go anywhere. It dies in the Senate quite quickly. But that's the beginning, and the pendulum kind of hangs out in the middle for a long time. It's a, kind of a 30-year period where we don't get a lot of action. The uh, industrial era, the 1880s, the 1890s, there's not a lot of movement. But when we get that progressive era at the turn of the century, we start to get really kind of a coalition of progressives and socialists and unionists and women and civil rights fighters like W.E. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. So there's more movement towards women's suffrage. And there's some successes out west, 1911, um, California uh, legalizes the right to women to vote. So there's definitely movement on that forefront. It's not until 1914 that that constitutional amendment is brought up again. Remember, it was 1872, so we're talking about, I don't want to do the math, but it sounds like 40 years before it's brought up again. And it again, gets defeated in Congress. Remember, an amendment has to get two-thirds of both houses and three-fourths of the states in a ratification phase, and we're just not there yet. But I don't know if you know what I know. It's 1914. Who knows what happens next? That's right. Bang, bang. World War I. So the women's suffrage movement really finds its success in uh, this union of the National Women's Suffrage Association and the National Women's Suffrage Association to the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And this is run by Carrie Chapman Catt, who decides that she and her organization is going to support the war effort. And this was unpopular in many women's circles, progressive circles, socialist circles. They were against the war, but they make this calculated decision that this is what's best for women's suffrage. And that group begins to be shown and supported by the Woodrow Wilson administration as a patriotic group, in a sense that women are doing their duty to fight the war, to lend their hand, and they're going to be rewarded, in a sense, with this constitutional amendment following the war. And that's what's going to happen. And this is in dire you know, opposition to groups like the American Women's Party, who were protesting like heck and marching outside the White House and holding signs against the war and really trying to radicalize the argument. And I'm not saying one is better than the other, but the truth is at the end of the day that Wilson is going to get behind the National Americans Women's Suffrage Association and support this constitutional amendment. So the actual passage of that amendment is a little bit rocky. It was defeated in Congress a couple times in 1918 and the beginning of 1919. But by the end of 1919, Woodrow 
Woodrow Wilson is, is able to round up those votes. He gets the necessary majority in the House by 30 or 40 votes, and it's really close in the Senate, but that stone skips across the water, and they get the two-thirds necessary. So in 1920, as the war is ending, it gets thrown to the states, and it's really kicked around there for about a full year before it um, ends up in Tennessee. And, you know, the opposition is really coming from Southern Democrats, Southern Democrats who are conservative, Southern Democrats who oppose civil rights, Southern Democrats who are standing on the principle of states' rights and you can't tell me what to do and yada, yada, yada. But I believe it was by one vote. I'm pretty sure that it was, uh, I'm going to say, like 50 to 49, something like that in the Tennessee legislature. So by one vote, Tennessee becomes the three-fourth state, I don't know what number that is, I'm going to say 67, but I'm not sure, to ratify that amendment. And uh, it goes into the Constitution, and it's one for the books. So I think that the basic argument is that women always had the right to vote, and that that vote was, in a sense, stolen from them at the Constitutional Convention, that it was a natural right. So in a sense, the argument is they're fighting for the government to uh, give them their liberty that they were born with to have a government that's not restricting that natural right. Certainly, it's gonna change the political landscape. We get prohibition after women get the right to vote. Women are more sensitive to that topic because they probably live with the effects of alcohol more than men enjoying the effects of alcohol. And certainly, that's gonna lead us into a more progressive voting bloc, which is good for Democrats as the Democratic Party becomes the progressive party. Under FDR, the New Deal, what are you talking about? You, you've gone off task, oh no. Where's my learning objective? So giddy up for the learning, guys. We hope that you did it good and that you got the 19th Amendment down. Down! Where attention goes, energy flows. Before I go, I want to do my shout outs. We had a, kind of a breakdown in Hip Hughes history. We had some really great donations and people showing their love. Caleb Milne, you gave a great donation. I want to thank you, brother. And Carrie Counselor, we all know that you're loving on the Hip Hughes history and we thank you for that. And if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And if you subscribe, go get someone else to subscribe because every time someone subscribes, an angel gets its learning wings. All right, there we go, guys. We'll see you next time that you want to do some learning on Hip Hughes history.